Okay, hi everyone. Um, welcome to yet another EMA industry um, knowledge share. It's going to be our last one of the year, uh, but I'll wrap up with that at the end and then we'll be kicking off middle of Jan next year. Um, but before we kick off, I'd, I'd just like to flag that earlier this week you'll have received an email to members, to, to everybody re membership fees. Um, and I just have to sort of want to say that we really do need everybody's support here uh, to bring a little income into EMA to keep to keep it going. So please, can I ask everyone for, for your support in, in trying to push payments through um, the business as quickly as possible? Um, it would really be appreciated. Last week, we heard from Simon at the Virtual Events Institute and all about their educational program that they, they have built. Um, a program I would certainly recommend people look into and to sign up. We don't know what activities have been going on since then, but people who didn't join, there's some information on the EMA website and um, a discount code that we pass. We can start now to see a vaccine coming into, so it really has an impact on health. Um, so virtual is, is not going to go away. Um, and as event props, we need to know more uh, about what's out there and what our options is. Um, so while similar to live, they'll, it'll, it'll be very different. Um, something, something today's presenters can shine a little light on. So today we're joined by event production agency Broadsword. These guys are a great London-based agency who work across both UK and international for numerous clients such as HSBC, The Economist, M&G, uh, T. Rowe Price, Clarivat, Thomson Reuters Foundation, and even the Labour Party. So some interesting insights there, maybe. Um, they've got expertise in both live and TV production. Um, and so we're very we're able to pivot uh, a little faster than some into the world of virtual studio hybrid production. Um, Anna and the team are going to share with us some of the some of the tricks of the trade on interactions between pre-recorded and live settings. Sorry, pre the <laughs> Gabriel pre-recorded and live settings and engagement tools. So Anna, over to you. Thank you, Richard, and and hello from us. Um, I'm just going to start by uh, by introducing us with a short video. Thanks so much for having us today. So much has happened this year. Uh, I think event agencies far and wide have been on a journey of reinvention. I'm Anna Green, Managing Director of Broadsword Event House, and I'd like to introduce you to my colleagues, Matt, our Commercial Director, and Ben, uh, Creative Producer. Matt, could you start by telling us a bit more about Broadsword? Of course, Anna, thanks. Yeah, we're um, at Broadsword, we're a technical and creative production agency. Um, based in London, although we have uh, offices in Manchester and a uh, small office in Hong Kong. Um, we're about 14 years old, um, and I guess before COVID, we were delivering live events globally for clients, including HSBC, Moody's, The Economist, um, and the Insights and Analytics company, Clarivate. Since COVID, um, we are delivering online events globally for all of the clients above, plus some of our UK-based clients as well. So T. Rowe Price, Thomson Reuters Foundation, M&G, and the Labour Party, to name but a few. Um, 
virtual events have been sort of as part of our blood, I guess, for about the last sort of 10 years. And so it's not really come as a new thing. Um, we delivered a number of different uh, events with multiple different clients. I think probably the namely the main one is um, uh, The Economist, where for three years in a row we delivered a 24 hour hybrid event. So we had 250, 300 people in Hong Kong, in London, in New York, uh, and we live streamed between all three over all time zones for a 24 hour period, bringing people in through sort of Skype and WebEx um, at the time. So very much I guess maybe not quite what we're doing now because the hybrid element isn't there, but certainly from the streaming perspective, it sort of brings everything around into one sort of full circle. And can you just tell us a bit more about the name of this session, the Corporate Events Carousel? What's the, the thought behind that? Well, I mean, I guess the carousel dictionary um, definition is a revolving case or tray. Um, so I guess probably in the next 30 minutes, what we wanted to do was sort of discuss and talk about how we've been approaching live events over the last six months. And the carousel element is you can take away whichever points work for you um, or you think that maybe you could use going forward. You can disregard the bits that you think, well, that doesn't really apply to us. Um, I guess it's probably a little bit like um, Yo Sushi for events. <laughs> So it's been a huge year of upheaval and change. How has Broadsword pivoted? Oh, well, um, I guess March sort of came and we literally lost every piece of business we had in, in the space of about a week, um, which, was, which was a massive shock. Um, as an organisation, we, we had 40 people. Um, we were working and had projects set up working across the globe. Um, we were due to be going out to the US um, and over into Hong Kong and, and the Far East for other projects that were coming up and, and everything just sort of got shelved, postponed and pushed by the wayside. Um, we sort of sat down and, and took a hard look at where we thought we could add value and what we thought we might be able to do to survive. And I guess we focused on our skill sets. So our knowledge from sort of the creative aspects and then the technical and production based aspects. And then also the fact that, you know, we have been streaming and we knew about streaming and a couple of people went off and, and learned to code and we sort of started to find our way from there really. Um, everything sort of changed in and around sort of June, July time when um, our creative director, Martin, started to look at building a, a TV gallery, essentially, in our offices, um, or as we're now calling it, a master control room. And we just started to sort of test run streams onto a Vimeo channel. And then we just sort of, I guess, in essence, moved up from there. Um, in September, we did a, a piece of filming with the Saatchi Gallery and actually explored and looked at the way we might be able to take everything we learned from the sort of MCR side of things and then what people were watching on telly sort of the one show and that sort of magazine style programming and say well how can this transfer into the corporate event environment and how can our clients start to understand maybe a bit more how you could do things that moved over and above zoom and so we created this piece called now playing and shared it you know largely with our client base to say well look this is this is how it could work and this is what we could do and I guess things have sort of skyrocketed from there. So now we have three MCRs within our building, one mobile streaming unit, and we've made connections and worked quite closely on some events with suppliers in the Far East, across Europe, and also out in the Americas. That's really interesting to hear, Matt. And with, with the MCR, ca can you literally work with, with anything, anyone? Is it, is it completely adaptable and versatile? Yeah, um, we've built this system which is essentially platform agnostic. So we can take anybody on any f platform or any feed. So you could be on Zoom, you could be on WebEx, you could be on Teams, or you could come directly into our system, um, which is essentially what, what we're doing now. Um, and then our control center mixes and jumbles it all together. We can fade things in and out. We can do keynotes, we can do panels, we can do fireside chats, and then it pushes it out and it will push it out to whatever platform you want. So again, 
can push it out to, to Zoom. We're on a Zoom webinar now from WebEx. It can push it out to a platform that maybe we've created ourselves and, and we've built, or it could send it to multiple things if people can only access certain different programs. Um, it also has the ability for us to use existing backgrounds on the front of my window, um, or we can add a virtual background should that be the way you want to go. So when we sit down with clients or enter the Zoom room, the, the first thing that we off, we're often asked is, so what about the platform? What should we do about the platform? Which platform would you recommend? Um, then what do you normally advise? Well, it's interesting. Thanks, Anna. With the, the platform, I often equate it to the venue in the live events that we used to do. Um, in that when you book a venue, you, you look at how it makes you feel. How does it reflect the message of your company and what you want to uh, the delegates to experience? So many website designers now, they'll talk about UX. They'll talk about user experience. And architects have been doing that for hundreds of years. How does the venue make you feel? And churches are built to make you feel close to God. Banks were built with these great big columns that gave you trust that they were good, solid organisations. And universities were designed so that they made you feel that they were a place of learning. So every space that you will go into, and, and you can have a think about the office that you would work from from your company. We, we had an office at Somerset House, you, um, and that had a certain feel to it. Many of our clients have offices at Canary Wharf and they have these great big glass buildings where you walk in and they're places of awe and you think, wow, this is, this is a great big solid company. So, so the space is very important. And when we think about the platform that we're having the event on is, um, is similar. If I was booking some sort of service for home, if I was ordering a taxi or I was ordering a plumber and I went on a website and it was a very cronky amateur kind of website I would immediately my thought would be these aren't a very professional outfit I'll go look elsewhere and so if you're talking about your company being forward thinking being cutting edge um, uh, and professional uh, going onto a platform that looks like something out of the mid 90s looks like something like MySpace or something like that immediately you've got a you've got a mixed message that you're giving to the delegates so the platform is, is very important and getting that look and feel right and, and clients are right to have a think about it. But ultimately, it comes down to the content that we put on that site. It helps to facilitate the message. It helps to engage people. It helps with the look and feel. That's a foot in the door. And then the content, we work very closely on understanding what the message is, what the narrative is, creating a story around that message. We all think in terms of stories we, we we build our life around stories when people give us uh, lots of complex information we can break it down into images and stories in our head it's the way that we process so understanding that message and delivering it in an engaging way on the platform is something we work very hard to do with our clients and actually a digital platform is a great place for doing that um, things which are hearts and minds changing behavior if you look at i know you you go to see a great movie at the cinema you watch a, a great piece of tv or a piece of theater afterwards you feel different about the world you look at the world slightly different so that through a different lens and that in essence is what many of our clients want our events to do they want delegates to come and then their behavior changes or they have more information or they have a different direction to take after the event so the platform and the content and having that joined up connection between the two, that's what we're aiming for. Thank you, Ben. That, that's really insightful and a great comparison to, to the real world as well. I do remember actually you, you telling me a story, now you come to mention stories, uh, of an event we did recently uh, with Mark Carney uh, and the way that he presented and how that added to the event. Would you just fill us in a bit on that, please? Yeah, that's a nice little case study. It was only for a couple of weeks ago, but uh, Mark Carney, ex-Bank of England, ex-Bank of Canada, now doing lots of work with the UN, obviously is a very experienced speaker. Uh, but we're often dealing with experienced speakers, but not experienced in the digital world. So, um, and I won't name names, but there were other people on that call who they didn't have the light set up right. They were kind of leaning in. They looked like, you know, they had the, the, the view of the, the camera kind of pointing up their nose and uh, and Mark positioned the, the lights and, and had the sound and um, 
he, he addressed the, the meeting very statesmanlike, but he also started off with a with a, a human story. You know, he spoke about stories and he spoke about when he first went into his office at the Bank of England, there was a picture on the wall which he took down and took to 11 Downing Street and gave to George Osborne. And there was a whole human story about that. But immediately, instead of talking about investments and, and things like that, you immediately start leaning into this human story. It was very interesting. And it was it, it stood out among the other speakers. And, you know, he wasn't doing anything, you know, groundbreaking, but he had the lights, the sound, the camera and started off with a with a story. And it, it, it really stood out on the event. Thank you. That, that's, a, that's a really good case study. So obviously the, the restrictions of this year have presented challenges, but they've also opened up a kind of Pandora's box of choice. And um, it can be a bit overwhelming. I know for many of our clients, we've, we've had to help them navigate their way through. So Matt, what, what would you recommend um, when advising clients on where to spend their budget? Um, well, I'm just thinking I should have started this with a story, to be honest with you. <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, missing that. I um, I guess we've talked a bit about the broadcast and Ben's just obviously talked a bit about the platform as well. And, and I think it's about finding that right balance between the two, um, which I know is I'm sitting on the fence getting splinters, but I, I think you need to consider the content first and you need to consider what message you want to say. And then moving on from there, you need to think about, well, how are we going to say that? And in what environment we're going to, uh, is that going to take place? And once you've got that into, into your sort of, into your plan and into your agenda, and you think, well, this is the message we want to get across. The platform does become quite an important aspect. And there are sort of many ways that you can do that from the entry level, sort of a managed Zoom, um, which is essentially what we're doing now, through to streaming onto an existing platform like Hopin or SpotMe or one of these other sort of plug and play sites through to a, a higher end sort of managed site or the, the next level is, is is creating something a bit more bespoke. So, you know, like a, a microsite, and I think we've done probably about 20, 25 different microsites over the last four months for a variety of different clients and um, and subject matter. And then there's a much more sort of higher end sort of custom platform, which, which we've created for a couple of much more bespoke events. Um, and Ben can explain a little bit more about one of the custom platforms we, we, we build in a minute because he knows more than I do. But the purpose behind building it was the nature of this particular event was quite was quite complex and the way that their client wanted the interaction between the delegates and not just facilitators but the delegates themselves and, uh, and how that would all move around we we sort of explored many off the shelf platforms and just didn't really find the right fit did we Ben I think and and actually when we then started to look at well, what happens if we made it ourselves and started talking to some developers that we felt that actually it was possibly the way forward? I don't know, Ben, you mm. can explain a little bit more. Well, I, th I think that one particularly, because it was kind of early, the, the process started earlier on in the year when we were all a bit kind of, which way, where's the world going? What are we gonna do? We've got an event here where we usually fly a thousand delegates from around the world to London and have this event. What are we gonna do? And uh, actually I still have this conversation where I feel we're asking people who don't know what they want to, what they want to do, we're asking them what they want to do. Um, I'm, I'm reminded of um, Henry Ford's quote, who said, if I, if I asked uh, my customers what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. And really <laughs> what we're getting from our clients is they'll say, well, we did the event last year, this is the format, do it digitally. And that's really not a great, we're in a different media, there's a different way of working. So we spent a lot of time with the clients uh, and scoping out this project and there was a number of stakeholders um, and really understand what the messaging was and how we're going to create that journey in a, on a digital platform, not try and recreate the live event just online. So going back to we, we built the platform, we made it on brand, it looked like you knew where you were when you landed on the page and who you worked for and all those kind of things. 
We made it easy to navigate. There was a lot of complex backend uh, developing and creating bespoke agendas. And that was very important. When I logged on as a delegate, I knew exactly what my day was, how I was gonna move around the site, because I might wanna go to a plenary room, then to a breakout room, then into a, a group huddle, and then an activity. So there was lots of kind of moving around, which those things are easy in the real world. They get more complex when you have to program them into a site. Uh, there was an element of um, uh, competition within the site there was gamification where you did certain activities and you connected with your peers and had these conversations and you awarded points so you have the back-end analytics where you get an idea of people's movement around the site but this was a we made it into a competition and these uh, people attending the meeting they were graduates they were young uh, people who are used to doing this kind of gamification and were uh, very keen to engage with the with the platform there were social feeds and I think really the key bit for me there was lots of kind of functions on it but it goes back to you know we're not reinventing the wheel to a certain extent the main plenary sessions they were kept in a format that was like tv you had somebody on the sofa they were based in Toronto the main host was based in Toronto he was uh, a bringing delegates in for live questions he was asking questions of the presenters there was lots of flow to the meeting um, and i think that engagement um, those moments of reflection those feedback really made it and for an online event it was really it was really special it felt like watching mm. know, a, a, an interesting tv show or you know you wanted to watch it it was uh, um, so, so it was it was a challenging event because of the complexities of uh, a global audience, uh, gl global speakers, um, ran over three weeks. There, there was lots of technical challenges in the background, but we were constantly thinking about what's the experience for the delegate. And I'll, I'll be honest, you know, there were challenges, but anything that's groundbreaking, there's going to be a few challenges. But by the end of it, we came away and the client's feedback was, you know, this was award winning. This is fantastic. And the, the delegate feedback as well, that they were, it couldn't have, couldn't, have gone, couldn't have gone better from that side of it. So um, I think it was that storytelling. It was about the platform. It was about understanding the client's needs um, and trying to do something a little bit different and not just replicate a live event is a, is a great success. I think, I think Ben, Picking up on one of the points you've just said, actually, was I think for me, it's those little touches as well. And what, what you guys did when you were pulling it together, I think, was, you know, the, the host, Paul, who was based in Toronto, he, you know, he was they're locked down over there as well. He was in this little condo, which, you know, has got a lovely view over over the bay. Um, but his whole house is, is, is sort of crammed into one sort of little kitchenette, diner, come sitting room area. And it just felt very squashed and trying to work out how to get him to broadcast from there without, um, without it feeling like we were invading his private personal space for three weeks was, was a bit of a challenge. And then coming up with, with the idea which we ended up doing, which is where we, I think about, five, six hundred dollars, um, hired an Airbnb uh, around the corner from where he was, which had a nice big white open wall and a sofa and we moved the television and we actually just put in a couple of webcams so that we could get this differentiation between sort of him straight on and then at an angle with him talking to the TV where you could see grads and delegates coming in and just very simply and, and relatively cost effectively made made a small little studio, which I just think for that just enhanced the whole process. Because every time you went back to Paul, we had that depth and the dimension to be able to just change the perspective of what we're looking at. And rather, than I would say what we're doing here now, which is where, you know, the three of us are all on one screen. And if I want to look at you, I actually look away from the camera because I look at you. He was actually looking at a television which had person he was interviewing and Martin and Sam in our MCR were able to mix in and out quite comfortably and, and make it all work. I think for, for me that was one of the little perks that just made it flow so much nicer and gave it a different dimension. 
I think I think you're so right, Matt and Ben. And I think the way that that we we positioned uh, the anchor, the host, and and at Broadsword, we really do believe that's something that's worth spending your money on. It's getting someone that really knows how to host one of these virtual events. But it, it gave the audience a home. Uh, as well and I know we talk about the platform being a home but actually that that human connection and um, whenever they they saw Paul there in the apartment they they felt they were home and it was a safe place for them to sort of be directed to the next part of the event and when it's running over a few weeks to, to get that consistency is is really really important and that's definitely one way to engage but Matt have you got any other tips on engagement because I know it's a really big topic at the moment yeah i mean it, it really is and i'm having a lot of conversations and i know we're slightly not necessarily scripted but we knew where the questions are and 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 i'm slightly off piece on this because i was talking yesterday to um our developer um and just looking at the sort of back-end analytics of um some of the microsites that we've been building and we were looking at how it worked and how people were engaging with it and you know, if I'm talking to clients moving forward, what, where am I saying they should concentrate and emphasize the time and, and not, and I think engagement is, is one of the key things and networking that, that we were trying to look out. And he was saying to me that, that the majority of the time, everybody logs on two, three minutes before a session starts and the main session starts and the majority of people log off straight after a session finishes and we've built a number of pages where we've had sort of number of sites should i say where we've had separate pages that have had discussion forums and topics and you know even the subject matter and the questions have been posed by the organizers but then the actual engagement on people discussing on those pages has not really been really well undertaken and yet there have been some events that we've done where we've had a streaming window and then maybe we've put a, a, a sort of a chat down the side of the streaming window on the same page and then that's where the conversation on each individual topic has come up and and the engagement within those sessions is so much greater and i think it's because people are there and it's almost like they're in the same room and therefore they can if they're just tuning in to get their content for that particular event or that particular session they can have that conversation and make those connections there. And so I guess what, what we were talking about was how do we make that design work so that everything flows onto that one sort of page in and around when people are having those conversations, which answers what part of your question, Anna, but I'm not sure it fully answers all of it because there is still that element of networking that um, I guess people still want to do is connect one to another. Um, and I think what I've seen over the last six months is people are still often trying to connect and relate networking to the way that we've done that in the in a live space. We might be in, I don't know, pick a hotel and you go out for coffee and you go out for lunch or post drinks and everybody's sort of there by themselves and one thing leads to another and people go and connect with people and they network and they build up those conversations. And there's this idea, I think, around, well, how does that translate to the real, to, to the virtual world? And I, I can't help but thinking, but it, it doesn't. And so why bother trying to recreate and why think of it in that way? Why not think of it in a different sense and, and sort of reimagine how you're doing it? So rather than saying it's a networking session, why don't we look at scheduling within your agendas some more collaboration time where people can break out into smaller working groups but maybe you're setting questions and maybe you're using some type of um collaboration app uh, there's a, a collaboration app that we've actually secured some government funding to to try and develop a bit further which is called axis and i'll happily um talk to anyone or share some details with, with some people um if you want to get in touch with me through the ema we can we can pass that on but um, what Access is, is you know, it's, it's a sort of a whiteboard based collaborative um, application where people can easily from their phone just talk and discuss projects or discuss a particular question and work out, you know, an answer to a, to a puzzle or whatever that might be. Um, but if you're doing that in a smaller, more, you know, 
concentrated group as part of a networking session. We're going to go to a break. We're going to send you all out to this room here. You know, take 15 minutes or take five, 10 minutes to grab yourself a coffee, you know, maybe answer a couple of emails and then come back and we want you to work on this with a group of people. If you're actually as part of your registration process, asking the right questions, you can be putting the right people into the right groups to enable networking to take place as people are working on a common project. And I might be working on this project with you, Ben, and we might be talking two way. And actually I go, you know what, I'm really interested in what Ben wants to say. I'm going to either drop him a chat through the application or find him on LinkedIn afterwards and say, hey, Ben, that was a really good com conversation we were having. Can we continue it? And, and so do, do you get what I'm saying? So networking in, in a slightly different way, in a more collaborative, you know, I guess, hackathon style mm -hmm. um, of, of collaboration rather than just randomly dropping 50 mm -hmm. people into a Zoom room and saying, off you go, mingle, because people aren't going to do that. And the analytics that we're finding from some of the sites that we're building up is that if you don't give someone a dedicated purpose to stay, they're just going to leave because they're mm. at home or what have you doing their own thing. Mm. Thank you, Matt. That's, that's really insightful and really interesting. Um, ben, I know that, that you saw something in terms of engagement at all that, that has been used in the live environment, but that has translated really well into the digital environment um, in terms of the, uh, the illustration that, that we used uh, for the, the big global graduate event that we did. Could you just give us a bit more detail on that, please? Yes, sure. We used a digital illustrator, the same that we have done in the live events, but I know it seemed to take on more of a life on the on the digital platform. Um, and it was a great for just capturing the key points. And then uh, Paul in his reflection session would then look back and for a day's worth of sessions where we're taking so much information and going back to storytelling and those kind of things and seeing visuals and pictures, it was just a little reminder throughout the event and at the end of the day, of what the topics were that's discussed and we shared those and people could have them as screensavers or they could you know just download them and refer to them um, so they worked really well and I think those little recaps throughout the event are important digital illustrator or, or doing little highlights videos throughout the day or at the end of the event and also most of the sites that we have the hosting probably runs for about three or six months so it's quite easy for us to host videos on there to be watched post event um, on demand as people feel that, um, uh, particularly in the meeting that we were doing with graduates, they were onboarding, they were getting to know their, their role within the organization. And probably in a, in a month or two months time, they would come to a point where they will remember the, the event, remember the topic and want to go back and view that, those slides again. So I think that's, that's really important. Um, uh, and, and really that goes throughout the whole of the meeting, having those different bits to it, breaking it up, having some imagery, having some storytelling, having some video, having some animation, having some Q&A. Uh, sometimes clients say to me that the, the retention span on, online is, is a very short attention span. And I thought of that, that for quite a while. Then I was thinking how we react, how we use digital throughout our normal and um, often we'll wake up um, and look at the news on our phone or look at WhatsApp. And what are we doing there? We're looking at information. We're looking for engagement and communication. We then might go to work. It's emails. We're going on Zoom calls. We're, we're essentially, we're, we're networking with people. We're chatting. We're, we might do emails. And then I, I even see my colleagues at lunch, They'll, they might watch a TED talk, they might watch a bit of YouTube or even, you know, it, there's entertainment there, there's fun elements, but they're basically on their screens for 12 hours a day. You know, so this idea <laughs> that we don't have a, we have a short attention span for our screens, I don't believe. I think what we have a short attention span is for something that goes on on the same topic for hours and hours and it doesn't relate to me and it's just very dry and it's not broken up at all. So mm. just thinking of that and how we do that with the digital illustrator, we did um, escape room games. We did um, you know, going into huddle meetings and having conversations, even at lunchtime, having, you know, we, we suggested, and I'm a, I don't 
think we should be on our devices for 12 hours a day. I think we should have, get out for a walk and, and clear our minds. But, you know, we, so we, we ask people to do that and send in pictures of their walk and share their, their life a little bit on the social feed. And it's interesting with a global event to see what somebody's doing in China and what somebody's doing in the States and how they, how they're, um, you know, what they're doing when they step away from the screen. So, um, yeah, there's lots of things we can use and there's lots of things which the digital world is really good at and it's got loads of pros to it. I was interested when Matt was speaking there about networking and trying to create something that doesn't really work digitally online. I had a client the other day who said, when we did our meetings, we usually write little notes on a post-it note, stick them on a wall, then we'll have a chat with them. How, how do we do that digitally? And I was thinking, you do that because it's really, really easy to do. Digitally, it's really, really hard to do. <laughs> you have to create all these. But yeah, so, so though actually um, um, access and, and using those whiteboards and having a facilitator, that's a way of doing it. That, that's a way of doing that thing with a post-it note, but just trying to replicate something that was really easy on the digital world. Don't, don't take something that's easy, make it difficult. Just find what's easy to work digitally. And there's lots of things yeah. and it's a great way to motivate people and there's a great way to share stories, but it needs to be used differently. Mm. Thank you, yeah, Ben. Just to jump in though, Anna, I think something you just said there, Ben, is really interesting because when you were, you were talking about people being online for 12 and 14 hours a day and we've done two events in the last month um, that have been full day. So, you know, from right at the start, you know, nine in the morning till five o'clock in, in the afternoon. And and so many people have been talking to me, you know, throughout 2020 about how that's not a great way to be. And people don't want to be on, as you say, people don't want to be on screens for that long. Um, and these are, you know, both external conferences. One was Thompson and Reuters Foundation, their, their trust conference. Um, and the other one was, a, was an event called the Women of the Future, which is a, a fantastic um, organization set up by a lady called Pinky Lalani. You should check it out. Um, but the, the pretext of both of those events was, or the reason I mentioned both of those events is that they, that they were full day. And I remember when the agendas came in and thinking, I'm not sure how that's gonna work, but actually the way we split, the way we sort of talked with them about splitting it up and, and, and moving the content about and for Thompson Reuters for the trust conference for example which you know is all about human rights and you know a lot of that subject matter is is, is quite heavy hitting but we, we, we took Antonio as the CEO that was that was the, the running the um, I guess the, the host tying it all together the, the facilitating it you know we actually pre-recorded him and we pre-recorded him at the sea containers hotel um up on the eighth floor bar so overlooking the river and off towards the city in the background and so all of his links had a very different look and feel to somebody sitting in their house and then we structured the the session so that keynotes ended up being fireside chats so they were more conversational than just someone talking um panels were obviously the panel discussions but then interdispersed with that we had videos played we showed certain piece of footage from the live event that took place in, in 2019 and just broke the whole thing up throughout the day and had an agenda that was very clear that people could dip in and dip out and see what it was. And again, as I say, it was just the, 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 the interaction and the, the number of people they had on the site throughout the day just stayed constantly high. And the Women of the Future event, which was actually two full days, it was equally the same. Um, equally had that same amount of connectivity and and attendance which for some of the other stuff that we've done which maybe has been a little bit um, more here's a webinar this is someone that's going to give a presentation and this is a panel hasn't had that same that same interaction rate the drop-off rate has been quite high over the course of the hour or two hours Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. That's really interesting. I think the, the trust conference is such a good example of the, the way that the videos were weaved into the, the, the live stuff. And, and I know we talk a lot about the value of pre-recording. Ben, you know, or, or Matt, 
why advise clients to pre-record part of their event? And we're used to working in live, so in digital, what's what's the, the benefit of pre-recording? Well, you have lots more control when you're pre-recording. There's not an awful lot of live TV that goes out and what does is very, very well rehearsed by a group of professionals. We're often dealing with people who aren't particularly rehearsed. It doesn't matter how much we ask for rehearsals. Um, they don't always happen or as, as long as we'd like them to. So th there is an element of risk. Uh, with going live and pre-recorded, we can make it slicker. We can bring in videos, animation, just make sure it's on message, it's on time. Uh, and then cut to to live Q and A or, or or more engagement pieces. You know, mix it up a bit. So th there's different things we can do. Uh, I think there's a place for both. Um, mm. Mm. Yeah. It also, it helps. I think it helps mitigate people that might have connection problems on the day. Maybe you know, uh, avoids the, the fact that they might drop out. Um, that the door might ring for. Uh, an Amazon delivery and, and there'd be another distraction and the such like. Um, I think I think there's 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 a real place for sort of pre-recorded. Um, and I think there is a point in that right here and now, Anna. Um, given What's that, that Matt? actually <laughs> well given that actually we're pre-recording this. This was all filmed, I think. What the time is it now? It is five past three on Friday the 4th of December. <laughs> it's not five past three on the uh, Friday the 4th of December now, though. it's quarter past nine on a uh, Thursday morning. Okay, so. Uh, so you get that's sort of our presentation, Richard. I'll hand you back over to you. Okay, am I live? <laughs> um, that was great, guys. And I have to say, you surprised me. So, because I thought that was live, live. It wasn't live. Yeah. That's what I'm hearing. Um, it, it wasn't was... live. No, it was. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that was really good because it felt very natural. It was a little bit jittery at the beginning, even even with you that there, mm -hmm. Matt, um, some of the camera and the lighting. But, um, oh, there you go. Look, someone in the chat box, Alexander, tricked me. <laughs> um, and, you were, and I think you were asking about that, Alexander, about live streaming what is better earlier on in the question. So what was better, um, live stream or pre-recorded? And I think you guys showed that you can mix mix the two mix the two up um, very nicely. The, um, the, the, idea, the idea, Richard, was very much to try and pre-record something that looked like it was live, not necessarily to, to fool people, but to give you all the idea that actually you, you can, in instance, you can record something, you can edit it down, we can then overlay slides at the right point in time to make it feel like it's one whole presentation, but then you don't have that added pressure. The other thought is that, you know, I've been here in the background answering, you know, people's questions and, and planning that, so you can then have a little bit more construction into, into how you respond to certain bits of Q&A. Yeah, no, I thought it was, um, it was excellent, some great insights and some you know, I put in that chat earlier, Ben, and I'd like to pick up on that, perhaps in, an, in another format or something, a bit about when you talk about getting people ready to present and how, you know, am I looking into the camera? Are you looking at my nose? Have I got my lights right? Such simple things. But, and it, maybe it's like, you know, okay, this is what it should look like. This is what it shouldn't look like. You know, it's like a school uniform or something. Um, but just to help people be ready and produce that. Um, that was great. And I think we can pick up on that, perhaps either from a little bit of learning to share best practice. But I also wanted to know a little bit about more about the MCR room. Um, and I did put in the chat space that I kind of see that as a, you know, BBC ITV studio news production with four or five people sitting at the different mixing dishes like you would see behind a big production. Um, with someone shouting, right, camera one, go to live feed, VT, is that correct? Let me yeah. Uh, let me just see if I can do this. <laughs> I don't know. This is this is this is real Friday night. Friday night with my friends. Uh, oh, oh careful what you show here. <laughs> if you can sort of see this, this is the screen that we're seeing. There's Martin in his little uh, mask and hat. 
Right. You can't really see uh, Matt. <laughs> control, controlling everything. But yeah, we've got, uh, we've got a team of three people that are, are, are based in, um, we've, as I said earlier, we've got three, three control rooms uh, in our warehousing in, in London, uh, South London. Uh, so we've got three people in today. Um, one person controls the Zoom. So it controls each of us as we're coming in into the, to the call particularly. We've got one person that then mixes through and puts the slides in and out, and then uh, a third person that essentially is calling the show. So making sure that's your the producer, there yeah, and producing. And there's also one talk back to us. So um, Martin was, was was giving us a countdown as the video was coming to an end, so we knew exactly what time we were going to go live again. Um, and and if positionally we, we we were we were in the wrong position. Um, we all got online at eight o'clock this morning so that Martin could make sure our connection was correct and everything was right and, and making sure it was in order and in place. And then he just muted us until you know, 20, past, 20 past eight. Okay, so um, just to dig a bit deeper on that. So if I'm John Smith and I'm in Doncaster and I'm one of your guest speakers and everything else, you're able to communicate with me and manage me as well as what I'm just presenting. I'm not just sitting here now at my computer talking to it, presenting to it or whatever, that you're, inter you're able to interact with me either through an earpiece or through something else on your screen? Yeah, so it all works almost identically to that. So um, we would do a, a technical test um, up to a week beforehand, ideally, where we would ask the presenter to um log on in the same place in the same environment that they would be logging on wh when they did the presentation there are a couple of ways we can do that one we can bring people into our mixing system which is called vmix um, and in that way we have complete control over the camera and the microphone on the machine that they're connecting to so we can mute you we can cut the screen if we want to not all Laptops we found can get in there mainly due to privacy and uh, security settings with some of the financial services we use. But that's not necessarily always a problem. We can always enter via someone logging on via a Zoom call or via a Teams or a WebEx call. So we can bring people in that way, bring them all into the machine. We then have that control. So I'm seeing at the moment, I've got you in a screen, I've got me in a screen, I've got Anna and Ben in a screen, and I can also see Martin plus I can see what the actual time is now. So I know, you know, if this session is due to finish at 9.25, for example. I know we've Go got to ads. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I, I mean, I, yeah, great. And I know that we're, 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 we are, and again, disclosure here to everybody that, you know, I, I've met you guys through this access thing and we've been working together on this concept. But Matt, you've really got some insight and thoughts on, because it's a massive challenge I know to EMA members, everything else, the whole thing around networking. They've got, you know, at times you've got sponsors coming to events and, um, or you, you just want to, you know, your people want to be at the event to network. And you, you alluded there to some of the stuff that you're thinking about with Access, about these workshops or something. Do you want, do you want to expand a little bit on that, about the whole, your thinking? You can't, you cannot network at an event a virtual event like you can at a live event, full stop. That's what you said. Yeah, uh, you, you can't because you don't know who else is out there, do you? you? You don't know who else is online at any of that one point in time. And as I sort of said from the conversation that I had last week with, with our developer, you know, people, that there are a number of, you know, we set up all these websites with multiple pages and, and actually some pages we find that isn't really getting that same type of interaction. Um, and I think almost by flipping it on the head and sort of thinking, not thinking about networking in the same way as we think about networking um, in the traditional live environment and thinking about actually pre preordaining maybe where people would go to and what groups are there. So a couple of events that, that we did earlier on in the year, um, when we asked people to register, we actually asked people to highlight certain answer certain questions so sort of five multiple choice questions from that point in time we then took that data and then tried to put people into specific breakout rooms 
to work on a collaboration topic over 15, 20 minutes, but with people that had the same preferences as, 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 as each other. And so with that, we were trying to enable people to then connect in a small group of 12 to 15 people, but from there go, oh, actually, you know, we, we made quite a good connection there, Richard. Maybe I will, outside of this meeting, you and I can connect via LinkedIn or, or message each other and say, well, let's continue and pick up this conversation individually. So you're sort of, it's a bit, it's a bit false feeding, but actually, if you just left it for everybody to try and mingle themselves, I think you don't get the same type of um, the same type of experience and and probably the same type of outcomes. No, and I, and I personally agree with that because I think you know, like at a, at a physical event, you know, the networking opportunity is a little chit chat, chit chat. But it's about getting a crack in the door, opening, getting a bit of light, being able to see if there's that rapport and potential for something. But I'm never going to go into a sales pitch or anything like that at that point. It's just like, oh, great to meet you. I'd, I'd love to drop you an email tomorrow or something. We swap business cards. But you're absolutely right that you can do that. Then you've, you've opened the door for opportunity, whereas in the past, person A didn't know person Z. So, yeah. So for the, and Ben might, might want to jump in here, but for the graduate event we did, where we had 650, 700 grads over a three-week period, we actually, everybody, and it was co very complex, but, but ultimately ended up working very well. Um, everybody had their own personalized agenda and they were going from main room sessions into smaller breakout sessions. But actually what we were doing when we were sending them to those breakout sessions, if you we were sending them to different breakout sessions with different people at every point in time during the whole process. So they were constantly trying to work with, you know, four, five, eight, other people that um, they hadn't been working and collaborating with over the course of, of that time and trying to just expand their network. Um, and then they got points, didn't they, Ben? I think it was like we did a bit of a leadership, leaderboard gamification, didn't we? That's right. We, we pushed it a little bit by, by giving people points and awarding people for networking. But as you said, I think... Um, the world's changed and actually I think there's loads of opportunities for networking on online. With that event there was a thousand people from all over the world and if they had come wow. together in London might have met little teams and connected and, and made some you know made some strong connections with your colleagues by using the platform I can really search um, out of the thousand people see who's in my team see who's got the same possibly interests as me or and I could join a whole load of other people you know you might argue that the connections aren't as strong because you haven't met them in person but the, the, the broadness of the possibilities for networking are huge and i just think about linkedin i think with people from all different kind of businesses around the world and we can have conversations and see if there's some synergy there in what we're doing and um yeah as so many things that we're dealing with the world has changed it's different but there's um, there's opportunities and you know i, I I'm, I'm an optimistic person. I'm so optimistic I carry a comb around with me. Um, but, uh, <laughs> so, you know, I, I'm positive and, and um, you know. Well, I was going to ask you separately on that, Ben, yeah. how, you get, how you get your lighting so well, because I've got mine bursting off the top of my head and trying to... Anyway. Um, but guys, I'm going <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> to... Polish it. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start to bring things to a wrap now. I, I think, guys, I just want to say thank you so much. It's been really interesting and really... Um, insightful um, and I have to sort of say and I think you show you are very much show this how things have moved in eight months how the whole industry and everything else has you know, I know everyone hates the word pivoted or shifted and how things are changing at such a rapid speed I think we're also now on a you know very early on in the you know massive transition for our industry and we're going to see how things are going to start to evolve and change now over the next six or eight six and eight months um, um yeah anything think, to add on that before i, uh, I, mean, I pull the curtain it down has, it has it, it, it's, it really has it really has changed i think you know in some elements though Richard, i think it's changed for the better as well you know i think there's a place for live events but i actually now think 
there really is a place for, for, for a virtual event as well. And I think it's finding that right balance. And if you think about it from a sustainability aspect as well, you know, the fact that people can connect actually quite comfortably without needing to travel around the world um, is only going to be better for, for the planet as if to everything else. So I think there's a yeah. real there's a real leaning moving into 2021 for live event, but a significant live event that is is an experience rather than just sort of having it for the sake of it, which maybe we might have been moving into. And then a virtual event for things where people need to connect, but maybe don't need to do it in person in the same way. Yeah, absolutely. Guys, I want I to get... Totally, I totally agree with that. And... Uh, yeah, the, the digital, the, the, the pandemic, the sustainability, the world's changed and we need to embrace it. Yeah, no, that's it. Again, I just thank close you. off now. Thank you all so much. Thank you everyone for attending. Guys, what's very really clear to me is that, you know, you don't just offer production services. You're very much more with the consultative approach to strategy and, you know, what's the best way of doing this to achieve your objective? And I think that's you know, we always talked about that having objective led solutions understand what we're trying to do what we're trying to achieve and how to best to get there so guys uh broadsword thank you very very much indeed thoroughly enjoyed that great work cheers thanks priya thanks for having us take care thanks for having us <laughs> priya anything to add to the team i think everyone's dropping off the follow-up by email but... no it's just to say thanks again to the team from broadsword i feel like i've watched an episode um uh, the film Six Sense with the twist ending. So it was pretty, it was quite, <laughs> quite interesting. Um, just to anyone that's still on, just to let you guys know that this is the last event for this year and we'll be back again with our industry knowledge shares on the 14th of January. Um, so from us, that just leaves us to say, you know, have a good Christmas and we'll see you in the new year. And thanks for joining us. And it's good night from me. And it's good night from Priya. <laughs> good night from me. <laughs> thanks everyone.